everyone. Um, my name is Johan and I work with an organization that is called LeapDAO. And um, yeah, I'll be talking about generalized layer two. And by generalized, I um, don't mean that it's kind of, uh, I don't know, that we abstracted some stuff away, but I'm specifically talking about being able to run smart contracts on layer two. So there has been a lot of layer two scaling tech like um, payment channels and these kind of things, but um, they don't allow you to kind of do whatever you want. You have to design it specifically. You have to design an application around it, or you have to design layer two tech to do something like limited. And I want to compare different technologies that allow you to run smart contracts any smart contracts. And I will also answer these nice questions that I put on Twitter, like is Plasma dead or uh, can I rollify my dApp? And what do I need to do to scale my decentralized application to like uh, thousands or millions of users? So I hope I can answer those questions. But uh, let me take a step back and introduce LeapDAO real quick. So we are a decent decentralized adaptive organization. Uh, we're not autonomous because there's humans and adaptive because we use holacracy. So the idea of holacracy is to kind of structure a company like a living organism with self, uh, cells that are autonomous and that interact. And um, the organization can also change at any time depending on the influences from outside. So that's why it's adaptive. Um, yeah, um, we do research on layer two for quite a while already, and uh, we are Ethereum Foundation grantees. Um, we're kind of all over the place, but mostly Europe. And uh, we have a couple of values in the org, running code over assumptions, which is obviously clear. So self-management over hierarchies, so self-management comes all uh, from holacracy, and this is this idea that Instead of having someone telling you what to do, you figure it out yourself. And that's really hard. And then coordination, and that's even harder. Obviously, we value rough consensus over voting. So we don't actually think that voting is always the best thing. And it also takes a lot of time. And we value community over market cap, which just means we, we like the people that we work with and don't care about uh, launching tokens. Um, I'll give, for those that don't have a technical background, I'll try to give a very brief but sufficient kind of rehearsal of layer two so that uh, you kind of know what the, the scaling tech is doing and how it can be utilized. So you can generalize and just say layer two makes blockchain scalable, but how does it do so? Well. It all starts with kind of the Ethereum network on the bottom, producing new blocks from the left to the right. And uh, you can deploy a bridge contract, uh, which kind of creates this connection to the layer two, which runs above. And then anyone can come and kind of deposit some tokens into these contracts, uh, into this bridge contract, and then they kind of move on to layer two. and. On layer two, there is some kind of entity that is either aggregator or validator or um, uh, yeah, um, some service that collects the transactions and the events like the deposit and uh, produces blocks from those. So they are uh, numbered and grouped. And then regularly, these transactions that are off the Ethereum uh, network, uh, they are committed back to Ethereum specifically to this bridge contract by either submitting the root hash, this is uh, what Plasma is doing, or by uh, submitting the whole transaction data. And this is what usually rollups are doing. Um, and then obviously um, anyone can kind of uh, observe the network and um, obviously this party that aggregates the transaction could make a mistake, for example, a double spend. And if uh, someone spots that, then the bridge contract offers you a possibility to kind of uh, challenge anything that is going on on layer two. So basically the bridge contract implements um, a light client uh, for this layer two network. And in the light client, you can prove that any transaction wasn't valid or a double spend or wrong execution or something like that. And that will um, either revert the transaction or give the coins back to you that you think you lost in this transaction. Uh, so you can make an exit. Um, 
so we've worked on this uh, tech for uh, for two years now, and I want to show you some things that we've built with it, so you get a feeling for it. Our first thing was in uh, Croatia, block split last year, and uh, we printed these nice paper wallets for about two hundred participants of a conference, and then uh, they could uh, buy food and drinks at the conference. So uh, we had a few thousand transactions there, and the whole event has cost us. I think six or seven dollars in transaction cost. So um, this is something that wouldn't be able on the mainnet. Um, also, you would wait in this queue for quite a while until your payment would be in. But because um, we used layer two, uh, we could kind of run the whole event and have little to no inconvenience for the users. Then we went to uh, Cannes, uh, the film festival in France, and we create uh, we presented this platform that does. Um, rights management on layer two. So we create uh, every um, rights owner could create a token for his movie, for in this case, Vice. And um, then there was a streaming site where people could kind of go and uh, stream a movie. And that would immediately kind of pay uh, funds to the rights holder. Um, then we had a, a game build um, on layer two by Max Stalker, a dungeon runner. Um, in autumn, uh, we tried something funny together with Social Distortion Protocol, uh, a game called Planet A. And um, it, we tried to model kind of the tragedy of the commons related to the global warming through uh, CO2. So uh, basically, people could kind of interact with each other. There was a form of social mining, um, but also there was um, there were emissions with every action that the user did, which increased the price and the pop-up economy. So um, the users could try to enrich themselves by kind of doing a lot of interactions with the network, but that would make everything kind of also expensive because the CO2 would increase. And we tried to kind of reflect back um, on the participants of the pop-up economy, what our collective actions uh, kind of um yeah how our collective actions can kind of um, affect us and then an interesting project was uh diora um we did a pop-up democracy with uh, a european party called volt um they had a congress in germany where they where about 500 people participated and each of the participants received this voting card that you see on the left side and with the voting card, they would do like traditional votes, like raising the hand or raising the card. But we added this little QR code at the bottom that would launch a burner wallet. And um, the burner wallet uh, would allow you to do a digital vote in addition to the um, physical ones. And yeah, we had about 200 people participate out of this crowd of 500 and um, give their quadratic votes. And um, this was not a techie crowd at all. So um, um, they were all ages kind of included. And most of the people didn't even notice that they used blockchain underneath uh, to do the vote. So um, what's our contribution to the whole thing? Obviously, we want to kind of uh, close the gap between uh, humans and blockchain. So we think um, good user experience means to have like fast confirmation times, no gas fees for end users, and high security. And we can achieve the whole thing using the existing technologies uh, today before the start of ETH 2.0. Um, and this is a summary of what I've just told you. So, um, um, while last year um, we've been working on Plasma, um, in summer last year a new um, technology came up, which is called Rollups. They're both layer two technologies, and I want to give you an overview of what's currently out there. So, if you would be building, um, if you would need scalability for your app, um, I think these are the choices that you would face. So I, I prepared kind of a comparison here. Um, um, I have uh, Plasma, I have optimistic rollups, and I have zero knowledge rollups here. And I'll, I'll kind of try to 
um, to show you um, that, uh, yeah, which one to pick. And then we'll kind of go through a tech overview and then I'll give a specific example trying to put um, a de decentralized application on layer two. And so you can kind of see what, what the reasoning is there. So I compared those based on a data model, execution environment, finality, exit duration, and operating gas cost. Um, so um, yeah, let's just go through it. So as, as you know, every blockchain kind of has an underlying uh, data model. And in Plasma, this is exclusively the UTXO model. Uh, why is it like that? Because uh, Plasma um, verifies uh, consistency, not kind of on every block, but um, the um, validity of the chain is enforced on the exit. So there is a specific exit game where you can exit funds. And because um, proving your making an on-chain proof about your balance in some kind of uh, data structure, for example, in a Merkle tree, would be quite difficult with an account model. So you would kind of need to present the sum of all your historic like deposits and withdrawals. Um, the UTXO model is uh, just simpler. So uh, to give you a comparison, the account model is what you know from, uh, from your bank account. There's just one number and it changes over time uh, when you have deposits and withdrawals. The UTXO model, uh, UTXO stands for unspent transaction outputs. And it's more comparable to your uh, wallet where you keep uh, bills, uh, money, money in. If you want to know the balance of your wallet, you basically have to take all the money out and count through the bills and sum them up, and then you know your balance. And the data model is very similar on chain. So um, you have a UTXO of, let's say, $50, 50 something uh, Bitcoin. Um, you want to pay something that's worth 20, then you have to spend your UTXO credit transaction that spends your UTXO worth 50 and create two outputs of uh, one uh, of 20 to the merchant that you're buying something from and one of 30, which is the, um, the change output. Um, that's the money that goes back to you. So UTXOs always have to be consumed kind of at once. And they have this uh, nice uh, property that by that they are kind of binary. So a UTXO is either spent or not. And that's why it's very, very easy to use in a, in a challenge game or in a proof. Uh, you can simply kind of um, make, make an assumption about the UTXO. You can say, look, this is a valid UTXO. I want to exit it from the layer two chain. And then you give a challenge duration and anyone can come and say like, no, here's a transaction that spends this UTXO. So it's not valid anymore. It, it's a spent UTXO and you can't exit it. So Plasma always, uh, always uses the UTXO uh, model. Um, there is uh, a different optimistic rollup implementations. So let's go to rollups. Um, if you remember the previous uh, diagram where we have had the Merkle trees, Maybe I'll go back to this. Um, um, exactly this one. Uh, so uh, the difference between Plasma and Rollups very briefly is that Plasma only commits the root hash of the Merkle tree of the transactions that have been uh, collected in a Plasma block. And uh, rollups, it also adds the transaction data. So it kind of uses while data availability has to be taken care of by the Plasma network. Um, data availability in the rollup situation is kind of delegated to layer one. So the transaction data is committed uh, to the chain, but it's not executed. That's where we try to get the savings from. So because message data has been has become much uh, cheaper uh, within some of the last uh, hard forks of Ethereum, we can kind of use it um, to uh, publish our transaction data. So everyone has data availability about things, but uh, we don't want to execute it because then we would kind of incur the same costs as if we just run our DAP on day one. So let's go back to this. Um, 
Yeah, so optimistic rollups um, are a design where we commit the data to the chain and then we give challenge durations. Uh, so everyone can kind of come later and say, hey, this wasn't a valid block, here's a proof. And that's why it's optimistic. So we kind of commit it first and then we wait for challenges. And then there's um, this popular design of zero knowledge rollups. Um, zero knowledge rollups work in the way that um, you bring some of the data and you bring a proof that all the transactions in the block um, are valid. And um, this uh, proof is verified on the submission, during the submission of uh, the block. And then obviously um, we know that um, there is no zero, there, there are no hidden inputs. So none of the transactions are private or anything like that. We just use zero knowledge in this situation to verify uh, that something uh, has been executed correctly. Good. Um, execution environments, so um, they have um, different plasma chains have tried to kind of implement a generalized computation. Uh, we, we have uh, built an execution environment, environment ourselves, which is called SolEVM, so Solidity VM. We implemented an EVM in the EVM, use it together with uh, Plasma. In the optimistic rollup space, there is um, optimism. Um, the plasma, uh, that is the thing, thing created by the Plasma group. Um, then there is Nutberry, um, there is Soli VM, again, can be used, and Arbitrum VM. Um, there is a couple more, so uh, this is not a complete overview. Um, if you want to learn more, there has been an interesting article written by a grant from um, Molochdal uh, recently on layer two. I think if you just search for Moloch and layer two, you'll find it. And in the ZK rollups uh, space, there's Sync VM, um, a VM that kind of is able to execute computation in zero knowledge. Let's look into finality. So um, this is kind of a difficult topic. Um, maybe let's start from right to, to left. So zero knowledge. Um, if ZK rollups, if you submit a block, the proof is verified right away. So the finality here, I would consider like minutes. And of, obviously, we're not talking kind of about economic uh, finality, because then to whatever I've put into this chart here, you kind of have to add the finality of the Ethereum network itself. But I'm just kind of talking about when a block or a transaction that has been included can't be reversed or removed from the data structure of the bridge contract. So in ZK rollups, um, it's immediate. In optimistic rollups, there's different setups by the different projects. So somehow, some have finality within hours. So I talked to Pinkywell, who created Nutberry, and he explained his consensus algorithm. But when you actually look into merged mind consensus, which was the first uh, consensus algorithm proposed for optimistic for rollups. Um, there are the finalities days. So basically, I think they also picked like seven days. And within these seven days, you can prove that any block that's in there is invalid. And then the whole thing is rolled back to the block before the invalid block. So here you really have to wait days until kind of you're sure that your block is in. But uh, look at it from the other side. If you know your block is valid, and then obviously no one will be able to challenge it. So the, this finality is uh, subjective. And in Plasma, we have something similar. Um, uh, you have a finality of the blocks uh, pretty much soon, and you will see that that isn't the same like kind of the exit duration for your funds. So let's talk about exit duration. Um, we already kind of described the bridge contract and that you can do deposits and exits from it. Um, the, you can use any ERC20 tokens or ERC721, or you could even kind of do inter-blockchain um, communication by like doing inter-contract calls through the bridge. Um, the exit duration is how quickly can you get money out that you have on the chain. Um, CK rollups, obviously, once the block um, is in and the proof is verified, you can withdraw from it. 
in optimistic rollups, you have to go past the challenge duration of the blocks. So that's somewhere between hours and seven days. And in Plasma, the exit duration is um, the specific parameter that is set up. So it's seven to 14 days, depending on how old your UTXO is. And exit duration um, is something that affects a lot of use cases. So obviously, if you have like a market like an arbitrage bot, you don't want to run it on layer two because you can't move money fast enough um, to even purchase arbitrage. So, uh, but this is not a user experience problem that is uh, severe in all use cases. Like um, you can build uh, something that's called a fast exit market maker. So someone who buys an ex a pen exit from you and pays you, let's say, 99% of the funds right away. And then uh, operate gas costs. So uh, in Plasma, we always just submit kind of 32 bytes. Uh, so that's very low per transaction for the operator. Um, in optimistic rollups, there is medium to high cost, depending on the size of your transaction. And obviously, in ZK rollups, um, you have to submit and verify the zero knowledge proof. And that is starting at 350,000 gas for um, SyncVM proofs, probably even higher. So um, you have pretty high costs here operating such a network. So um, I guess. Um, we want to find out how do smart contracts even work on top of rollups. And this is a slide where I kind of try to give you an idea of, um, of how a life cycle of a contract can be on a rollup. Um, for this, yeah, yeah, let's just go through it. I think, um, so if you have a smart contract, um, and you want to put it onto layer two, uh, you won't just be able to do it um, the same way like on Ethereum, so connect to the RPC and send a transaction. Um, there are some rollups um, that use um, um, that use their own uh, VM, like Soli VM and Arbitrum VM, and there are some rollups that use um, the contract running on layer one to verify things on layer two. So um, when you um, when you have the code, you either need to recompile it or you need to kind of um, um, make it available. So, but in any case, the contract code recompiled or not to a rollup, um, first of all, goes on to layer one. So it's a kind of available in the case of a challenge. And at the same time, it will be picked up by the validator of the layer two network and kind of taken into its execution environment, into its VM. Um, now, let's say a user sends a transaction to one of these smart contracts. It goes to the validator. Uh, the validator executes the transaction, creates a new block. That's step three here. Um, um, yeah, it generates a state route. Um, creates a transaction list and then um, it anchors um, this on on the plot, on the um, on the bridge contract, and that just means that you know transaction data and the uh, state route is submitted. And now let's assume that this validator was malicious and we have like an honest observer or even the sender of the transaction um, that has observed that and wants to kind of go and. Uh, uh, yeah, challenge that. So that's step five. Uh, the challenger needs to bring in the transaction, the anchor, and the state. And then there is a challenge manager contract that will kind of set up everything given the data from the user so that on layer one, a challenge can be run. Mm, it will either, you know, initiate uh, the contract call to the deployed contract on layer one with modified state, or it will kind of use this true bit verification game where you have a multi-step process to kind of uh, talk with a challenger and the solver uh, to find out if this transaction or this block has been executed correctly. And then once we know the result, 
then this will go back to kind of the bridge contract and either the block will be reverted or the um yeah the challenge will just be uh, closed um so um i've already talked about that there's different execution environments so when you um when you look here into um, Nutberry or Optimistic VM, it's set up in a way uh, where all challenges can be done in one step. So, uh, um, and if you look at SolidVM and AVM, they kind of rely on the TrueBit verification game. So, what do we mean by that? L let's look at the TrueBit verification game. Bit like verification game first. So let's say you have a computation, a transaction execution. It has every opcode um, that is executed is kind of a single step of this execution. And we can roll it up, like from in this example, from 0 to 14. And um, if we have two parties, one uh, challenger and one solver, um, they can either, they both agree on the first step. That's the step when the VM is empty or just uh, loaded with the program and the transaction itself. And the last step, which is uh, the result of the computation. And let's assume they disagree about the last step. So they can do a binary search kind of. So the, uh, the challenger um, asks the solver, uh, hey, what's, what's uh, the state of your VM? Let's compare total state of your VM at step seven. And then the, um, the solver um, kind of looks at the VM at this state of execution and hashes all the relevant data like memory and stack and whatnot. And it produces the hash. And then they compare the hashes of the VM and they find they are the same. So the error must be somewhere in the second half of the execution. And they kind of continue uh, comparing states of the VM until they find two uh, consecutive states um, where they agree on the previous one, but they disagree on the next one. And then what, uh, what both Arbitrum VM and Solar VM can do, they can kind of, they have the, they have the ability to run any single step on chain within the block gas limit. So at this moment, the on chain VM can kind of be initialized with step 12 and it will run until step 13 in the program. And it will decide if the solver or the challenger are correct. And this will resolve the whole challenge game about invalid execution. Um, you can imagine that this takes hours and is kind of clunky because, you know, what if we have a gas storm, then sending a lot of transactions will be uh, delayed or very expensive. Um, another uh, way to kind of tackle the problem of verifying off-chain computation is what Optimistic VM and NutBerry are doing. So they kind of take a contract and they create a contract corpus out of it. So most of the opcodes, um, they're kind of, um, uh, yeah, yeah, they can just kind of be executed like that on layer one in case of a challenge, but there are a few um, that need to be changed. So for example, if you have as load and as store, that means that you interact with storage. storage um, if you have a contract deployed on layer one, it doesn't know what the storage state is um, on layer two currently. So what both OVM and NutBerry do before they deploy a contract, they kind of hollow it out. So they replace every instance of an uh, S-load, S-store, call, or static call opcode um, with the call to the execution manager. And the execution manager has been set up before at the beginning of the challenge with the relevant data at this point in time that kind of existed when the transaction in question has been executed on layer two. And this rewriting of the code before deploying it uh, gives the ability to kind of run every challenge as if it were on layer two uh, within the block insulin. So um, I kind of tried to take you into the details and explain how um, the different um, execution environments work. Um, and now I want to jump into kind of comparing um, Plasma and Rollups. So um, Rollups have been 
um, quite a high uh, at the end of last year and beginning of this year. Um, um, there have been a couple of articles on the internet that kind of claim that um, you know there there are the superior scaling technology and um, within the team we kind of uh, set out and we try to really kind of compare um, plasma um, rollups with kind of tiny transactions, so simple transfer transactions, and rollups that actually contain uh, smart contract transactions or zero knowledge proofs. And um, there is an article, so I've included a link here, the bit.ly link. Um, it's an article that we just published uh, yesterday and a QR code that goes to the same thing. Um, the title of the article is Scalability. Uh, Rollups are not a cure-all. And it kind of, uh, yeah, let's just go through it. I'll, I'll try to explain it. So what we've done is um, we uh, simulated uh, um, layer two blocks um, containing different amounts of transactions. So. And then we measured the gas cost for the operator to kind of, you know, anchor these blocks in layer one. And what we find that because plasma has a static kind of cost, no matter how many transactions there are, uh, the cost of a single plasma transaction, like um, within the rollup, uh, the more transactions there are in the block, the faster uh, kind of uh, this uh, cost approaches zero so uh, it's kind of like driving a bus if you get a lot of people in there it's very cheap and the bus only takes kind of the space of one car on the highway so um yeah you share you share in the cost or the space on the highway um and then um running simple roll-up transactions which just means we took the average cost or uh, size uh, or gas cost of a uh, a transfer transaction, ERC-20 transfer transaction. And then uh, we included uh, different amounts between one and 200 transactions in one uh, roll-up block. And then we looked at the cost. And that is, uh, that is the red line here. So we are approaching a, a, a certain kind of minimum there. And, um, and then uh, we took... Um, we took um, a tornado cash transaction, so the full zero knowledge proof and uh, all the you know the heavy message data that you have if you uh, try to build a zero knowledge app, and uh, uh, we included a bunch of transactions um, um, in a layer two block and measured that, and um, the results are kind of interesting. So um, a, a block with a 200 kind of zero knowledge uh, transactions on layer two, it costs um, about uh, 5 million gas uh, to be submitted to layer one. So that just for one block, that would be a cost of $10 for the operator of the layer two network to include 200 transactions. And we calculated the savings. So when you have a layer two block that only contains one transaction, um, then with the zero knowledge proof, then you save about 60% of your cost. Um, and this number increases the more transactions are in there. So if there's two transactions in a block, you save 80%, uh, five transactions, you save 87% and so on. And the thing that we found is that the savings rate um, approaches 93%. Um, so if we include more transactions in a block, we're actually not becoming any much cheaper than 10x. So this is um, a limit. I think that is quite important to point out. Rollups can only kind of, with uh, fat transactions, can only give you um, improvement of 10x. And yeah, you probably say, cool, 10x is a lot already. Thank you. Um, but uh, there's a lot of use cases out there like um, micropayments or um, um, just business models that require a lot of uh, transactions um, that are still not viable at 
at this cost of kind of running the transaction. So if you have a microtransaction that pays two cents and you spend one cent to kind of put it on a roller, then you know that's probably not an application that will ever exist. Um, so yeah, please check out this article and I would be super happy about uh, feedback. Um, we included uh, the code, everything that's necessary to kind of to verify the numbers. And yeah, uh, um, and we kind of found this limit that with rollups you can go 10x uh, than transaction cost on the menu. So, um, so yeah, um, I want to, last thing now, um, I want to take you through an example use case. So um, we will be looking at um, a specific DAP and we'll try to select the right execution environment to put it on there uh, to, to kind of make things cheaper. So um, I decided to have a look at Colony. Um, on the bottom right, I kind of, um, I, I'm showing the architecture of the Colony contracts. Yeah, maybe, maybe let's dive into Colony. So Colony is, um, is the service um, that exists on Ethereum where as an organization, you can kind of write out tasks and um, there is um, a structure to the tasks uh, that enables um, either team members or external contributors to kind of um, um, complete tasks and then um, have the task uh, being paid out and record reputation in your organization together with the tasks. And then if there's disputes, you can use your reputation, you can stake your reputation and kind of um, uh, vote on things. So Colony um, streamlines a, a very kind of a general process that is probably found in a lot of organizations. And um, but there is quite a lot of contract interactions. So actually, um, we are using Colony in LeapDAO as well. And when we do bounty payouts, uh, sometimes our transactions cost about 2 million gas. Um, just because if you have three participants in a bounty, for example, and that is due to kind of all the features and the reputation and all this kind of stuff that's calculated in the colony contract. So obviously you, if you kind of pay uh, $5 or something to pay out a bounty, it's probably not a bounty that pays out $10, but it has to be substantial. So you don't have too much overhead costs. So could we kind of make colony faster? So let's look at the requirements. They already build all their contracts. Um, they require the EVM execution. And obviously they don't want to change their contracts to kind of deploy them on layer two. They don't want to rewrite everything. Um, they want to have low fees and fast block times, obviously. Who doesn't? Um, they probably need deposits and exits of ERC-20s um, into, um, the, into the layer two and then within the layer two into the bounty contract or something like that. And then um, probably they want to have their reputation kind of provable on layer one so you can kind of export data from the rollup and use it in some other dApp to do something with it if you want. Um, so I took the same, um, I took the same uh, ta uh, table that I created before with the overview and um, we can already kind of make conclusions for this specific case. So um, even though you can run smart contracts on Plasma, what these, these smart contracts, they work in a different way because they work in the UTXO model. There is not really um, a thing like the account state that you have on Ethereum. So it's more like, um, we call them, yeah, it, it, it is more like scripts that can also use a state, uh, but it, it, the state is not bound to an account. So this would require a rewrite of the colony contract. And because of that, we can kind of, uh, you know, uh, cross plasma out and say, um, that's not possible to use in this specific use case. And then for the ZK rollups, uh, there is a new VM. So again, we would need a rewrite of uh, the whole thing. And uh, it's probably, there is no EVM. Um, in ZK rollups. So that's probably also not a technology that, um, 
that colony could use. Um, so left our optimistic rollups, and then we would probably go and pick one that has an account model and um, one that um, I don't know has probably has been kind of verified or something like that. So look into OVM or NutBerry or ABM. Um, what I want to say is that. Um, um, there is a different technologies out there and there is no cure all. So in this situation, because, um, uh, we want smart contracts to work exactly like on Ethereum and there is investment already, we go to rollups and we probably will go and claim this like a 10 X improvement. But if we have another app that uses, um, high frequency kind of micro payments, um, a streaming service or something like that then probably um, rollups will not cut it in their cost structure and then we will decide for Plasma or we will decide for ZK rollups. And um, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's the conclusion from my talk.